and it's Kay from Crafting with Kay. How are we all doing? So welcome to my new segment called The Reading Nook. Um, I reached out to uh, an excellent author called Sharon Hannaford and she uh, gladly gave me permission to read her Hellcat series to you. Uh, she's one of my top two favourite authors of all time. I have a couple of mugs, so fill up a cup and drink and yeah, join us for the project. So, what perfect diamond painting to use is the little dragon <laughs> reading a book, drinking a drink, cozying up for the night, but <laughs> really for the evening. So yeah, grab a project, grab a drink, and yeah, listen along. Uh, just a heads up, I'm not the best at reading out loud, so I will probably butcher some names, uh, but please, <laughs> I will get there in the end. Either way, I hope you enjoy uh, this new segment. Take care, guys. Enjoy. Chapter 1. The nightclub was packed for Thursday night. Just my luck, Gabby thought sourly, wondering how many more times she was going to be hit on before she tracked down her target. Between the men, the flashing lights and the pounding music, her annoyance gorge, gorge was on max. Her patience gorge was on zero. Not a good combination. She casually swirled the whiskey and ice around in her glass as she swivelled on her bar stool, doing another sweep of the reeking mass of dancers with her supernatural senses. She growled in frustration. Zilch again. She drained her glass and was considering a real refill when she felt a small vibration against her left breast. She ser <coughs> She ser reached into her bra and pulled out the tiny phone, flicking it open and read read the message. She sighed. The message wasn't good news, but at least it meant a reprieve from the sensory abuse of the club. She quickly wound her way through the lo through the throng of barely clothed revellers, deftly avoiding groping hands and drunken invitations. When she finally burst out the door into the crisp night air, she paused to drag in a few deep breaths and adjust to the sudden lack of light and noise. The bouncer leaning against the outside wall looked her up and down appreciatively. Someone I can help you with, sugar? He drawled, pulling another drag from his cigarette, held semi-concealed in his huge paw of her right hand. She surmised his boss didn't like him smoking on the job. He was tall and broad-shouldered, overly muscular, your typical garden variety nightclub bouncer. She watched his gaze travel over her high-coloured uh, bolero jacket and her form-fitting black mini dress that showed her toned thighs all the way down to the four-inch heels of her patent leather black boots, clinging lovingly to her shapely calves and then slowly back up again, this time taking in her lustrous urban curls cascading in gentle waves onto her shoulders. I'm off, Ju I'm off duty in 20, he hinted with a grin, his teeth seeming very white against the dark chocolate brown of his skin. His eyes finally met her own emerald green ones and she worked to keep her expression flirtatious. He didn't need to see the real Gabby Bradford. He hadn't committed the kind of crimes that her elusive target had. It amused her to think of how quickly his sexy leer would switch to astonishment if he got close enough to touch her, close enough to feel her concealed accessories. She contained her dark humour and instead gave him a smile of apologetic regret. Sorry, big boy, I have business elsewhere. She gave him a wink, but I might be back later. He sighed gustily as she sauntered away from him down the dimly lit sidewalk. As soon as she was around the corner, she dropped the sultry sway and quickened her stride, heading swiftly for the parking area around the back of the club. There was a shortcut to the lot, but it was a dark, unsavoury alleyway that most people would avoid at this time of night. As she stepped into the alley, her internal radar pinged. She wasn't alone. She didn't, know, she didn't know whether to sing hallelujah or curse like a sailor. After spending three hours in a club, hell on, in club hell on Gabby's nerves, her mark had been hanging around out, outside in the back alley. Adrenaline sh surged, but she controlled her physical reactions, not showing any outward signs that she knew he was there. She strode briskly down the uneven tarmac, keeping her head down and exuding an aura of distracted vulnerability directly into the path of the dark shadows, hunching between rows of garbage bins where a tall, trench-coated figure waited with inhuman stillness. The pale stranger, lounging in the shadows, may have been surprising in his choice of hunting grounds, but there was nothing surprising about his method of attack. 
As soon as Gabby drew level with him, he detached himself from the shadows and in an instant was just behind her left shoulder. Gabby feigned a, shock, a gasp of shock and spun to face him, flicking a hand to the back of her neck as she did so. The speed of her movements must have startled him because as she held the curved blade of her sword aptly named Nex, pressed against his cool untanned skin, he froze, staring at her with his mouth slightly open. Two grossly elongated canines gleaming dully in the dingy glare of the distant streetlight. Angeli Morte, gasped a bare whisper, his eyes wide with sudden fear. Gabby snarled in annoyance, her face no longer calm and composed. Yes, she growled. I've heard some use I've had I've heard some use that name for me. She the pressure of the next the pressure of Nick's against the place where his pulse should have been increased minutely. I'm told you've been a bad boy, Tannis, she hissed. I've heard you like to make your meal scream. She watched as the realisation of his fate crossed his face. He knew he'd already been tried and found guilty. That that was when the pleading usually started. Thomas tried the go-down fight and bring instead. He spun away from Nick's and came at her from behind lunging for the back of her neck with a speed and force that would have sent most people flying across the alley. But Gally had spun, Gabby had spun with him, levelling her blade at his chest. He surged forward, unable to break his own momentum, and Nick slid easily between his ribs, bisecting his heart before his brain registered his mistake. Gabby grimaced and yanked Nick's out of the vampire's chest as the body slid to the ground in a graceless heap. As she bent to wipe necks on the bloodsucker's trench coat, she caught the faint trace of a familiar scent coming from the far end of the alleyway. The man stepped out of the shadows, a cocky grin on his face. He was tall and lean in an endurance athlete sort of way, though his shoulders were broad and muscular enough to make him look slightly out of proportion. His tussled, sandy blonde hair gave him an approachable boy-next-door look, but Gabby knew better than to be fooled by outward appearances. Thanks for the help, she said, her voice heavy with sarcasm, as the newcomer approached at a gentle lope. I didn't want to spoil your fun or deprive Nix of another notch in her sheaf, Angeli Morte, <laughs> he said with a wicked grin. Gabby rolled her eyes and shook her head with a long-suffering sigh. Drat, she cursed, looking down at the vampire again. This shithead's a young one, he's not going to turn to ash. We'll have to stash him somewhere until clean up the team gets can get to him. The body had already taken on a shrunken, desiccated look of a long dead corpse, but didn't appear to be decomposing any further. Make yourself useful, Wolf, she said, turning the body and making a shooing motion with her hands towards the industrial garbage, industrial sized garbage bins clinging like overgrown limpets to the grimly brick floors. He gave her a disgustedly reproachable look, but grabbed the collar of the trench coat and dragged the body away without further comment. While he stashed the body safely out of sight, Gabby made a call to the clean-up team. As Kyle straightened and wiped his hands against the denim-covered fires, she remembered that he called her away from the bar with a text message. He said it was urgent. Now tell me, Kyle, dearest, she had said advancing him on him with neck still held loosely in her right hand, intrigued, wearing with annoyance. What was so important that you poor had to pull me off a job? Put that thing away, he grumbled grabbing her sword hand as she got close enough to touch him with the tip of the blade. Where do you stash her in that outfit anyway? Gabby arched one eyebrow arrogantly in and in a movement too quick for the human eye to follow, slid the blade black down into the sheath nestled between her shoulder blades. She shook out her head to hide the tip of the hill which protruded ever so slightly from the top of her jacket. She didn't know what the difference made to Kyle. He knew that she could kill him with her bare hands. But maybe he was thinking back to the last time someone saw her holding the sword and called the cops. It was a tense, cr it was a tense scene when they arrived and tried to disarm her. Only Carl's calm head had kept the damage to a minimum until cleanup team arrived. One of the Magnus Magus crews arrived was able to wipe memories of the whole event off the cops' minds. The air was suddenly tinged with the scent of adrenaline. Gabby's body responded instinctively to Carl's tense excitement as he elaborated on his message. The Magi of Surveillance team have picked up a huge power shift near the Sports Stadium. There is some weird nullaby with, with the ley lines running under there. 
They predict as many as six or seven demons will try to cross the void at the same time. He reported with a hint of teasing chit chat now gone. Shit, that many? How long have we got? She was all business now. I need to pick up some weapons on the way. She looked down to Erza. And some clothes. Carl turned to head back down the alley towards the parking lot, a superior grin on his face. I got you covered, he threw back over his shoulder. I figured you'd need some work clothes, and I brought a selection of your favourite weapons. As well as some prototypes from the geeks at the tech department. Byron says the veil will be finished in around 45 minutes. My van is just here. She raised her eyebrows as they strode into the lot. My car is faster. But I saw it parked three blocks away, and my van has work clothes and weapons, he countered. Fine, she conceded impatiently. But I'm driving. If my car gets towed, you're going to get it out of the hook. Out of the hock. The last time I went into the police station, they tried to arrest me for weapon smuggling. Carl had to stifle a chuckle. Stifle a chuckle. Her last trip into the police station was uh, to retrieve her car was unforgettable. When she'd walked through the metal detectors, the cops didn't know whether to chat her up or arrest her. Springing the car would have been easy if she'd decided to use her charm on them. She was so pissed that the towing of her car had caused her to lose track of her mark that she took her temper out on the officers instead. Carl was glad he'd been there to calm everyone down before things escalated into actual violence. Even though there'd been over half a dozen cops in the station at the time, he knew where his money would have been. It wasn't on the boys in blue. He'd left his van close to where the, they exited the alley. He'd once been a people mover of the sort that families with lots of kids drove in, but he'd ripped out most of the interior, blacking out the windows, giving it the appearance, the appearance of a camper van, complete with bed and minibar. What the average inspection wouldn't uncover was the hidden compartments underneath the bed and in the floor, concealing a mini arsenal of weapons. He personally replaced the original engine and upgraded the suspension, tyres and braking system. It was one of the great loves of his life, so it was with great resigned reluctance that he threw Gabby the keys. The stadium was a good half hour drive from the city centre, so there was no time to waste arguing with her. Gabby drove the souped up van like a sports car, speeding through red lights and crossing intersections without slowing. Carl would swear she took some of the corners on two wheels instead of four. He was used to her driving, but winced uh, but winced every time she redlined the engine. Suddenly she slammed on the brakes, almost hurling him nose first through the dashboard. Only his inhuman reflexes saved his boyish looks. He grimaced at the smell of burnt rubber from what was left of his almost new low-profile tyres. A tabby cat stood frozen in the middle of the road directly in front of them, its eyes turned almost completely black by the onslaught of the van's headlights. Gabby stared at it for half a second, and Carl could feel the slight whisper of supernatural power trickling, tickling the hairs of his arms. Then the cat hissed loudly and bolted off into the darkness. Bloody hell, she cursed, flowing the accelerator and sending them hurtling down the street again, the engine whining in protest. What exactly did you say to it, anyway? he asked curiously. Gabby's ability to communicate with animals was a staff of legends, but he was one of the very one of the few people who knew the true extent of her gift. I told him to go home and stop chasing cute little pussy tails around at night or a big bear monster was coming to get him. She replied with a stern gruff. That should keep him off the roads for a couple of nights. Carl grinned, shaking his head. That was the Gabby he knew and loved. It was quick to save the life of an innocent, no matter what species, as to take the life of a monster. She was actually kind of sweet in that way, but nobody had the rocks to say that to her face. Not even him. What are you grinning at? she demanded, swinging the van violently onto the highway and rocketing past a road hauler rather than break and fit it behind him. He didn't bother, reply, bother to reply, hanging onto the seat for dear life as she maneuvered into the fast lane and headed out of the city towards the stadium. <laughs> to distract himself from the abuse of his van, Carl ran over in his mind what he knew about the old stadium. It had been a top class sports arena not too long ago, but had fallen into ruin after being abandoned. It would probably seem odd to out-of-towners that such a valuable piece of property had just been left to go into ruin without any attempt to redevelop it. You had to be a local to understand. The urban legends surrounding it were many and varied. Many centred around it being haunted, but by who or what was hotly debated. Some said dead, sp some said dead sports stars or a group of cheerleaders who died under the stands 
Some were convinced it was an army of long dead warriors or soldiers. Other urban legends claimed the place was cursed, and yet others said it was protected by aliens from another planet. But the one thing all the stories agreed on was that it was best to stay the hell away from it. Teenagers still dead, each other to spend a night in it, and the so-called Satan worshippers gathered around to practice dark rituals. Fortunately, most of these didn't actually have a clue what they were doing. And it was sometimes used by drug lords and other criminals to conduct illicit businesses, but not as often as an outsider might expect. Police made a token effort to keep people out of it, but they rarely patrolled it anymore. Most lawful citizens stayed away from it in any case. The truth of the matter were known only to a select few. Those who were mag Magi by birth and those who were trusted by the mag Magi High Council. The stadium had been built over an area where an unusual number of strong ley lines merged before fanning out again to individual streams. This convergence caused a pool of supernatural energy to build up below the ground until its effects could be felt even above the surface of the earth. The power manifested itself in a bizarre phenomena at the stadium. It began with freak accidents and mysterious occurrences during the initial construction. The Council of Magi tried to have the construction suspended, even claiming it was built on ancient burial ground to get the landowners to build elsewhere. But the construction went on as planned. Once open, the stadium suffered one disaster after another. Stands collapsed, electricity was off more than it was on, kitchens caught fires, showers turned themselves on and off, and the injury stats for athletes were astronomical. Within months, teams refused to play there, and staff refused to work there, and contractors refused to keep repairing things. Two years after it opened, the stadium was abandoned. The only thing still being maintained were the security lights, which were supposed to enable police to patrol it at night. There were eight-foot security fences surrounding the perimeter of the stadium, but vandals, drug dealers and teenagers had long since cut holes in the fencing. The place was essentially open to anyone who wanted to get inside. Tonight, Byron, their boss and head honcho at the SMV, a.k.a. the Societus Malus Ven Venatori, would have made sure that the police patrol, including one of their co covert team members, would do a sweep of the place to clear out anyone loitering. The place would be deserted tonight at least until the demons turned up. They left the lights of the city behind and sped towards the light industrial and agricultural area that surrounded the stadium. There was a parking area on the far side of the stadium which wasn't fenced off. Gabby, Kyle directed Gabby to it and they found that some of the other members of the SMV had already gathered. The stadium loomed large and ominous <coughs> in front of them. A huge, o huge openings in the wall that once allowed public access to the interior now looked dark, like dark moors waiting to swallow up unruly trespassers. Gabby parked the blacked out van near the others, turned, up, turned off the engine and threw Carl the keys. I'm going to get dressed and kit up. See what else she could find out, she ordered, climbing out the dark depths of the van. She didn't need any light. Gabby could see perfectly well in the dark. Yes, ma'am, Carl shot back, throwing her mock salute and getting out the van. He pretended to realign his neck and check his arms and legs were all in one piece after that wild ride. Idiot, she hissed from inside the van. Don't think just because I can't see you, I don't know what you're doing. Now get going or I'm going to spit on all your knives and make them rust. He sighed dramatically. You could be a cruel, cruel woman, Gabrielle Bradford. You know exactly how to poke all my soft spots, he lamented mournfully. The only soft spot around here is your head, her tool was muffled by clothing. He chuckled and sauntered off to join the others. A team of three were climbing back through the jagged rip in the fence, and they quickly looked off over to report the area clear. He touched base with everyone else who had already arrived. None of them had any more information than he did, so he headed back to the van to update Gabby. When she emerged from the van, the bystander probably wouldn't have known it was the same woman. As she stepped into the dull light thrown by the security lights, he could see why they called her Angeli Mort, Angel of Death. That was the name she'd earned for herself among the greater supernatural community, though her fellow, hun fellow hunters tended to use a different nickname for her, one that Carl had been calling her for years. She was dressed in, she was dressed in black, tough and leather pants, tight-fitting Kevlar reinforced jacket and black flat-soled boots. With her hair tied up in a severe knot, she made no attempt to hide the myriad of weapons attached to her body in every conceivable way. 
She appeared cold, ethereal and deadly. Cole knew just how deadly she was, one of the more recent additions to the Hunter Squad. But she had already notched up the highest number of clean kills. She stepped out of the van and began pacing back and forth across the tarmac, stopping every now and then to stretch out or warm up her muscles, running through a short sequence of complicated martial arts moves. Gabby's hair raising driving made them good made them good time to the stadium. They had ten or fifteen minutes before they should expect any kind of action and he could have gone to a quiet, calm place he went to when difficult fight was staring him in the face. He leaned back against the van and watched the members of the other elimination teams arrive and begin getting ready. There was a hushed, anxious kind of excitement running through them. Byron had called up everyone he could get hold of, and a few he couldn't. He was obviously going with the with the concept of throw the kitchen sink at them. Mind you, half a dozen demons coming out of the Ether world at once was something you would want to throw the kitchen sink at, if that kitchen sink happened to contain a nuclear bomb. Demons hated everyone, the other demons included. They very rarely ever made it any kind of attack in numbers over th- two or three, and generally attacked alone. He briefly wondered if the Magi at H at the SMV headquarters could have been mistaken. Could have been mistaken, but shook that off. They'd never been wrong about an attack in all the time he'd been part of the SMV. Sure, they'd missed some attacks. It's impossible to monitor every inch of the city the size of this one. But when they said there was an attack coming, they were right. He looked around again, counting SMV members, milling around in an order in an ordered sort of chaos. Normal elimination teams consisted of two hunters, one banisher, a magus, a magus, a magus capable of sending some de- demons back to the other world and clean up crew in a specially kitted out van. The clean up crew consisted of an eraser, a magus gifted at wiping human memories, a medic and a driver slash muscle person to help with hauling bodies when necessary. The driver was most often a werewolf, but occasionally a magus or shapeshifter. There were different team setups for captures and for street patrol. For those details, he left Byron and the rest of the SMV council. It wasn't for him to worry about, and as long as they teamed him and Gabby together as much as possible, he didn't interfere. Tonight, he greeted all three <coughs> of the other hunters. Douglas, a tall shapeshifter who knew more about weapons than he and Gabby put together. Matthew, a werewolf particularly welcome tonight as werewolf saliva, was fatally poisonous to demons. And Lance, a very powerful magus who could launch fireballs at you as easily as he could set you alight from where you stood. He was affectionately called Zippo by the rest of the team. And nobody tread too hard on his toes, not even Gabby. Kyle didn't know all the other members who'd shown up. He knew a few of the offensive magi the one who'd come, some kind of gift <coughs> that could be used in the fight. And most of the banishers he'd worked with before but the cleaning up crews he rarely interacted with and they were switched out on a regular basis. He knew some faces, but not many names. The medics knew intimately, of course, both of them. He had, had patched him up more often than he cared to remember. He blew out a deep breath, hoping that the medics wouldn't be needed tonight. Gabby had resorted to muttering and cursing to herself, and Carl glanced back at her. He almost grinned, but thought better of it a bit, and bit... Hit back at the last second. Her vocabulary got more inventive in direct proportion to the adren- to her adrenaline level. She'd had a short temper and a florid vocabulary for, vocabulary for as long as he'd known her. He turned back to the van as memories finally cracked through the controlled wires he tried to, to cover with his grin with. He started to get various weapons strapped onto his own bodies as an excuse to keep his face turned away from it as he remembered their very first meeting.